Hello, hello. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much to Dr. Ting for presenting his research. Uh, we're going to move on to the uh, science fiction future plenary talk. Uh, my name is Victoria Jaggard. I'm a science editor at National Geographic, where we are currently celebrating an entire year of space uh, as part of a program that we're calling Starstruck. We're getting very excited across the organization for all things space related. Uh, in fact, I believe a little later today, you'll be getting a sneak peek at a documentary we're making about the Apollo program. Uh, I am joined today by some incredible people who've done some incredible work with uh, science and science fiction. Uh, would you like to go down the line and introduce yourselves real quick? Sure. My name is Yatasha Womack. I'm author of the book Afrofuturism, The World of Black Sci-Fi and Fantasy Culture. I'm also a sci-fi writer. I have the Rayleigh Universe series and an upcoming series called A Spaceship in Bronzeville. And I like to write films. <laughs> I'm Daniel Suarez. I uh, was a systems analyst for about 20 years, and then I had the bright idea to write a book uh, about some concerns I had about uh, tech and automation in society. And since then, I've been a sci-fi and high-tech thriller author. And generally, I write books that are not in the distant future, but are in the present or the very near future. And one of the obvious drawbacks of that is that I'm probably going to be around when those dates come by, and I'm going to have to answer for the decisions I've made. <laughs> but I don't really do it to predict. I, I more or less prototype the future in my books, and I try to do uh, you know, very good research to ground my prototypes in reality. And I do this primarily because I think the pace of technological change is, is accelerating. And I think in many ways we're living in a sci-fi future already. So I try to bring my readers through some of the issues and challenges we're going to be facing. And uh, my, my next book, as a good example, Delta V, is about uh, commercial space exploration, which I think is probably going to be one of the most significant things we've ever done. And I think it's going to give us the opportunity to not only preserve our ecosystem, but uh, also civilization. So. OK. Uh, my name is Mark Okrand. Uh, by training, I'm a linguist studying primarily American Indian languages that had, at the time, zero speakers. Um, but what I did after that is work on some other languages that also at the time had zero speakers, because mostly what I've done is develop the languages for Star Trek, uh, mainly Klingon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I've done, is tried to figure out how to communicate <laughs> with these people who may or may not be out there. I'm also probably the only one on this panel who has actually communicated with outer space. I've actually... I'll tell you later what I did, yeah. <laughs> Teasers. Yeah. All right. Um, well, I just wanted to say, uh, of course, thank you all for having us here. I was lucky enough yesterday to get a sneak peek at some of the work that your students are doing, and I was just kind of blown away by the realities of projects that are in development right now. I mean, mining water ice on Mars, communicating with lasers across vast distances, mm -hmm. actually manufacturing things in space. And what really struck me about these talks is these are real people working on real projects that, when I was their age, were pure science fiction. You know, the shipyards of Utopia Planitia is maybe going to be a thing pretty soon, for all I know. And I think that's just an incredible, incredible thing. Uh, I'd put out a personal plea for everyone in the room uh, Get on that transporter system, please. <laughs> I would love to have that happen. Uh, and so since we have this captive audience of really smart people, I wanted to hear from our panelists, what are some of these space science fiction staples that you would like to see come to life within the next 50 to 100 years? We went this way before. <laughs> sure. Uh, well, I think that what excites me most is just the opportunity to possibly time travel and teleport. I do write about that in some of my, my sci-fi novels. I use that as a device. And on one level, as a creative, it's a great way to push past limitations and not feel like you're rooted in a, a specific reality. Uh, as a creative, it was fun for me to write about the Rayla character kind of hopping all over and being in different time zones and not having to deal with assumptions around who she should be in the present. But I do think that that would be a really cool thing to do. <laughs> and uh, I, I just, uh, I think it's exciting to look at a lot of the quantum physics research that's taking place that's really exploring those possibilities. All right. Uh, 
I think the thing that I'm most focused on, I'm, I'm curious, how many people here have read a book called The High Frontier by Gerard K. O'Neill, 1976? I'll raise my hand too. <laughs> uh, that sort of tells me what sort of heavy lifting I'm going to have to do here. I, I think right now a lot of people have what Isaac Asimov would call a, a planetary chauvinism. That is, uh, we are very focused on trying to occupy planetary surfaces. One of the interesting concepts that I, that I saw in The High Frontier was this idea that we would lift uh, off of the Earth the, the power generation that we need to power the Earth, and in the process create space colonies to generate an entire cislunar economy. Now, originally, O'Neill did this. Uh, it was right after the 1973 Arab oil crisis. In 1976, he wrote the book because there was an energy crunch. And then, of course, fossil fuels were discovered. They found new sources of it, and for 40 more years, we started burning more fossil fuel. And ironically, it was that extra energy that is, is creating the climate change we face now. And the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says we have about 12 years to start to address that situation, and we're going to face catastrophic climate effects. So I go back to O'Neill's work thinking, if we could lift our most carbon-intensive industry off the surface, power generation, and have orbiting solar, uh, solar satellite power stations and space colonies and really accelerate that entire space-borne economy that that would allow not just the saving of, of the planet, but also the, the continued expansion of our economy, jobs. It's also, I think, a task that would unify humanity, and especially the young generation, to get up into space to remove those borders and, and basically have a very bright future. So that's, that's what I'm focused on in terms of sci-fi. Yeah. Great. Well, I come from a very different sort of perspective from everything else in sci-fi, because I'm not a science fiction writer in the sense that I'm, I dealt with scripts that somebody else wrote, mm -hmm. right, and had to do that. But I've thought about all this stuff, and a while back someone asked me, of all the things invented for Star Trek, or created for Star Trek, of the, of the technological things, uh, what would I like to have be the most real one? And I think everyone expected me to say universal translator. <laughs> um, no. I don't know if that's if universal translator is a good idea. It's a handy tool, but it's it's not it's not uh, the be all and, and great thing that people think about because if you if everyone's only hearing in the same language all the time, and not hearing, uh, not having to deal with translation on your own, you're not getting the perspectives that other languages bring and other cultures bring. Everything would be exactly the same, and I think that would stifle creativity to not have to deal with, uh, the, with the way other people are thinking. Therefore, the transporter is cool, yeah. because it gets the timing, is the, is the outer space things take so much time, and we don't have, as an individual, so much time. So if there's a way to deal with that, whether it's the transporter or something else, that's what I would like to see happen. 100% yeah. agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, so as people who are involved in the creation of science fiction, do you feel that science fiction and actual science are kind of feeding each other over the, t over the years? Are, are you seeing this sort of interplay of, I saw this in science fiction, and so I'm going to work as a scientist to make it a reality, as much as I see this in reality and I want to make it my science fiction? Shall we keep up the pattern? Uh, we can. Take it up. You know, I, I think, unless you wanted to no. jump in, it sounds like you wanted to jump in. <laughs> okay. Um, well, actually, I think that for me, just the, it, there's an obvious relationship. Uh, I think a lot of the, the science that we work towards is sometimes inspired by what we see in science fiction. And then there's an expectation that what we see in, uh, uh, there's this idea that the science fiction at some point should be supported by things that we can do in the world of science. Uh, the problem with that is that it doesn't always trigger the imagination uh, and that a lot of the things that we come up with are kind of based on things that we see. And then sometimes it can be based on things that we think we can already do. Mm. So the, I think one of the exciting possibilities around sci-fi is really continuing to help push this notion of what we can create, especially as it comes to, I think, creating possible utopian societies. I know that there's an excitement about dystopia right now in a lot of sci-fi, where we feel like it's the end of the world. But I like to remind people that uh, just in our, our Earth experience, there have been a lot of so-called dystopias uh, and apocalyptic moments that we've moved past. So you can make an argument that we're living in a post-apocalyptic moment now for some, for some spaces and for some cultures and for some people. And those elements of those prior, post those prior apocalyptic moments are usually drawn from for science fiction as if they never took place. 
And so I always like to say, you know, let's look at human relations and how we can improve human relations through a lot of our science fiction and our stories. Well, I think you're exactly right when you talk about pushing the envelope. I think that's what sci-fi does. I think it's easier for us in a way because we don't have a budget to worry about. And uh, the other thing is, you know, I, as a sci-fi writer, I can explore just beyond the edge, just beyond the frontier. And I can almost prove by my email trail that there is definitely a feedback loop because what will happen is I will write a book and then over the ensuing years, somebody will get in touch with me and literally directly inform what I do next. Mm. That either you know, some people here at the lab uh, are interested in things I wrote about, and then I come back and visit them in, in this, this constant you know, uh, cross-fertilization. And again, when I meet with scientists and other people, they're very rooted in reality and facts, and they have to be far more cautious. Whenever I'm doing research for a book, I run into this all the time, I, I sort of pester physicists about things like gravity and, or you know, a gravity mirror, I try to find a gray area in physics into which I can couch whatever narrative device that I want. And they're constantly trying to say, well, no, I don't think that's possible. And then finally, when they say, well, OK, that might work, I'll say, that, that's what I need. And, and I don't think scientists have that luxury, clearly. Yeah. But um, it's definitely, it, it goes both ways. Yeah, I was going to say the going both ways part is what, is what I'm thinking about uh, with, the, with the kind of work that I've done prior to Klingon, and I'm not taking any great credit for this, it's just luck uh, that that happened. Most of the time when you hear uh, outer space strange aliens speaking in science fiction movies, they're speaking either absolute gobbledygook or perfectly good American English, right? <laughs> Unless they're mean, then they speak British English. Yeah, British anyway, English, yeah. <laughs> if they're the uh, villains. Right. Yeah. Um, and that changed around the, around the time of Klingon, not because Klingon has terrific relative clauses or something like that, that's not why, but I think for whatever reason, I think the internet actually had a lot to do with that so people could talk to each other uh, in easier ways than they could before. But watching these things uh, prior, to, prior to this, and, well, and, then, and now actually if you, in any new science fiction movie or movie, a fantasy movie, you know, Game of Thrones, anything like that, the languages are all real these days. Uh, if, if you see something, where people are just going gibbly bob that's very unusual all of a sudden. Not all of a sudden, over the past 30 years or so. Um, but prior, prior to all of this, watching it, I got the sense, not being a scientist, a, a, a rocket scientist like you guys, uh, that everything I'm watching is real. This, I know it's science fiction, I know that they haven't quite created this yet, but it's based on solid science. It's not just made up out of nothing. Except for when they talk and then it's ba it was based on absolute nothing. So the, the, the hard science, uh, the, 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 the attention given to the hard science and everything else, uh, that attitude has gone over to the other things, to the artistic stuff and to the language stuff, so that that's based on hard linguistic science as well. So it's, a, it's the same uh, interconnection, but in the opposite direction. And I think a lot of folks would probably agree that with science fiction in particular, uh, it's often a great tool for being able to explore not just real world science, but real world social issues yeah. and uh, either problems that we'd like to solve or things that we think may be problems down the line as technology and science develop. Do you feel then as creators involved in this space a sort of responsibility with the work that you do? in terms of how it's going to influence what happens in the world at large? I feel a responsibility, and mostly because I know that a lot of people have been encouraged not to use their imagination. Uh, the, the imagination is, is often hijacked when people talk about, you know, focusing on realities, focusing on what it is you think you can do, and in building from that perspective. So in that sense, the imagination can really be a tool of resilience to help people push beyond their circumstances so that they can even envision a future. And in envisioning a future, that then inspires them to feel like they have agency in that future and that they can take steps to create the kind of world that they think values humanity. Yeah, I would agree with all of that. It is, uh, <laughs> it is funny, I was thinking, oh, I was gonna say that. Um, I don't know, that idea of the Overton window, what is it acceptable or what is considered real I think that's one of, the, one of the great things you can do with sci-fi, or fiction in general, is expand people's perspectives. Put them in the role of a character or characters and let them see the world through other people's eyes. And so I think in that sense, it definitely changes the scope of the discussion. 
Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. And again, from the from the funny perspective, where I'm where I'm coming from, uh, when I when I created Klingon in particular, the the task was to come up with a, an alien language, meaning a language that's not like any language on Earth, with the understanding that the people who were going to speak that language were Earth people, you know, actors. Um, but in order to do that, in order to come up with something that's not like an Earth language, I had to know what an Earth language was. Mm -hmm. So, looking at all, at all kinds of different languages and based on the kinds of things I studied and so on, I said, okay, that's the way it is. What is not that? So I think it's the same thing in terms of thinking about the future, thinking about things that, that, that are to come. It's based on what is, because you can't dec decide what, what's going to be unless you, know, unless you have a good starting yeah. point. So all, the, all the, the, the hard science and the looking at the social situations we have now determine what the, uh, where the ideas are coming from and where they're going. And when it comes to space exploration in particular, what do you see as being some of the both hopeful futures and the challenges that we may be addressing in science fiction today? Well, I think the fun part that people like exploring is just the, the cyberpunk aesthetic. And this whole idea of, well, you know, machines, will robotics take over? And uh, even if we're integrated with them, how we will balance humanity and, and be able to maintain our sense of humanity in the midst of this hybridity. So I think that's one piece that people like to explore. But I also think there's really the metaphor of the cyborg, too, and this idea of bridging who you are with maybe what's being cast upon you and using that as a metaphor. For, for life and how people create hybrid existences in unique circumstances. Well, one of the, one of the things that interested me so much in, in the next book that I did was, you know, I've read a lot of sci-fi growing up, a lot of hard sci-fi, and a lot of it lives, you know, 500, 300, 1,000 years out. And there have been some more recent entries that are, you know, present day. Uh, what, I, what interested me in doing this next book was building a bridge, if you will, to the present, where we are right now, to that sci-fi future that everybody imagines. Because I've spent a great deal of my, my teen years thinking about just that. And it always seems to be another 20, 30 years away. And at what point is it really going to start happening? And that's why I sat down to do this next book, to try to figure that out. So I, I went around the world, basically talking to experts, trying to understand what people were working on that might be the catalyst that really starts it. Not sort of, but actually does. So that was one of the things that got me very hopeful. In that entire process, I realized that, and I, I firmly believe there's no technical impediment to this, it's always that lift cost. Hmm. You know, that payload cost per kilogram, getting up, that's really, that is the big barrier that we get over. And of course, reusable rockets will help with that. And what interested me was, again, getting masses from on top of the uh, Earth's gravity well, asteroid resources, mass drivers on the moon, whatever it's going to take. So I don't know, that is the type of thing that I'm really focused on as a, as a hopeful, uh, very possible event. I don't know about hopeful, but I, what, what I would like, okay, again, coming from where, where, where I'm coming from, uh, is deals with communication. I mean, if there's folks out there, uh, how are we going to communicate with them? And how are we going to prepare to communicate with them? Uh, the, the, the people at SETI, for example, you know, are, are thinking about things like this. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, you know, what, now you guys know better than that. Was it Voyager or something that put that record? Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, the gold record. The, the gold record, right. Yeah, I was on a panel once with the guy who decided what goes on there, and it was very interesting. Um, is that, is that the way to do it? I don't know. It's, it's a start, but just thinking about, you know, how are, you, how are we going to deal with them? I think the way that people are doing now with electromagnetic radiation and things like that is, is probably a good start. But if we really encounter somebody out there, what are you going to do? Uh, the most obvious science fiction, pop science fiction example of that lately is, is Arrival, that movie, mm -hmm. um, which is based on a great short story. Uh, that's kind of made up. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's going to work like that, but the, but the thinking behind it is, is right on. I think we need to start thinking about it. I would like to hope that people start thinking about, you know, what are we going to do? How are we going to recognize what is communication and what's not and things like that? That's a tricky one for yeah. sure. And there's also a lot of conversation about how the world in general is going to even react if we ever make contact. Right. How do we handle that? Are we going to 
freak out, basically, or are we actually going to be excited in, in that hopeful kind of way that Star Trek imagines we make first contact with an alien species and it unites the planet, right? That's because they speak English. Or they're fine. <laughs> <laughs> just different wrinkles on the forehead, right. that's all. Yeah, I do wonder, though, uh, just about how viewing yourself as a person in the universe transforms you. And just really playing with that idea uh, around your sense of responsibility, around just how we engage with people on Earth, uh, and thinking of ourselves as being not just human beings, but intergalactic in many ways. Um, looking at our, our bodies, our very existence as really bridging spaces and times, and being part of this larger continuum. I think that could be really empowering for people. Actually, that's the part that I would love about it, that idea that we, we are not alone, that there's you know, all of these other communities, other beings. The part that would upset me is, I think science would become a lot harder because if we run into another uh, civilization that's a million years more advanced, you know, it's kind of like, I get the feeling like we would want to find answers to things mm. and, and perhaps they would have some sort of curative uh, relationship with us. But there's always that idea of initial discovery, which I think is so exciting, which to some, some degree would be denied to us if you're dealing with a civilization that's a million years more advanced. Like, oh, fusion, that's really cute. <laughs> I mean, we did that way back, but you know. And then how would we know if we actually interacted with one? I mean, if they're, they're depending on the perspective or the, the energy level that they're functioning from, you could be interacting and not know you're interacting. That's right, they're on it's, 12 dimensions. Right, we're making an assumption sometimes around what that, how they're going to show up. That's a very good point. I remember seeing a, a documentary talking about the, the colors of things, and of course it's our impression of what they are, but the spectrums that we absorb with our eyes, when you see them in other spectrums, things look, of course, radically different. And then you start thinking about a multidimensional universe, and again, arrival kind of touching that the temporal dimension, and you're right, an alien species could be so completely alien, not just in the way they think, but literally the way they engage with the physical reality. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, I got in trouble about that with colors <laughs> in, in Klingon because I decided, all right, the Klingons oh, physiologically yeah. <laughs> are different somehow. So it wasn't canon what you did, right? It's become canon. <laughs> if I said it, it's canon. Oh, good. Uh, it's uh, a superpower. Right, right. So I made the color words not work the same way that they do in English for a lot of, a lot of human languages. Oh, that's, that's perfect. And there's been all kinds of praise and criticism for that. <laughs> so that means I must have done it right. Exactly. Because, I mean, there are organisms on Earth already that don't see in the same spectra that we do. So right. we have to think about how they're interacting with the world. And that's already such a challenge, I think, for us and how we interact with animal species on the planet. How, how is that going to affect how we interact with an alien species or how they would interact with us? Yeah, uh, from, from, from a linguistic uh, perspective, uh, one of the things that's interesting about doing uh, all this kind of stuff is translation, okay? Uh, the people uh, dealing with translating into the Klingon and they do. There's all kinds of stuff that's been translated into Klingon. They, they have to think about it because Klingon has a limited vocabulary. Uh, it keeps growing, but it's, but it's limited. Have to think about, okay, what is it that you're trying to say and how are you going to say it in the other languages stuff, which makes you focus on, on, the, on the message on, uh, as opposed to the, uh, the vehicle, as mm -hmm. opposed to the, the particular constraints of one, langu one language or the other. So it, it opens you up to thinking in a different way that you haven't thought about before, mm -hmm. which, which builds on what you were just saying. Yeah. So I, I can't help but think that, and I hesitate to say it, but CGI, I think, helped in one way in the movies, and that is, I think prior to that, the budgetary requirements were such that, again, the aliens would typically just have different wrinkles on their foreheads and, and speak with English accents. But brine shrimp, for instance, this is a species on the Earth, is just so much more alien than typical Star Trek aliens mm -hmm. were in the past. And, and one of the good things about that idea of CGI then again informing sci-fi writers is you really start to think in radically different ways. Uh, Vernon Finger, I'm trying to remember the book, was it uh, A Fire Upon the Deep, I think, where he had a, a race that was sort of a hive mind of furry creatures that could increase their intelligence as they gathered together and then separated. One would have a commanding personality and it's just so different in every way, physically, mentally, and I don't even believe they, they saw the physical world with, with eyes. So. Mm. Yeah, it's all sorts of interesting questions about morphology. 
And I think it's cool to remember, too, that the term alien itself, you know, the, a lot of the initial creation of the word alien wasn't necessarily to revert to people who were not or beings that weren't on Earth. Right. It was really used to refer to people who were, say, just on Earth and saying that they didn't have the same ways. Uh, I think one of the early citizens of one of the Jamestown colonies was a person of African descent. The term alien was used to describe him in court documents to take away his property so mm -hmm. it couldn't be passed on. So I think just that metaphor of the alien, or even how we use it today around illegal aliens or uh, undocumented workers, I think it refers to a certain mentality uh, with respect to difference. Mm -hmm. And so it's really cool to think about how we can integrate these ideas and, and look at ourselves as one. And you know, it's our, our fundamental perception, one where we're saying, okay, this entity is very different from us, instead of really, I guess, building a foundation to see how we're similar and just how those processes, how they process, uh, just transforms their experience. So it's the other. You know, mm -hmm. you identify them outside of your experience and you don't have to deal with that person, but this would be bringing them in. Yeah. Right. And then looking at how that could, you know, collectively, you know, if, if you're just looking at Earth and people from different spaces, how you can create shared futures and realities. And when you think about other entities uh, that are more intergalactic, who could be coming from different perspectives, how you would create shared entities yeah. and, and be equally in influenced and inspired. It does seem to be one of the sometimes less realistic aspects of science fiction that a lot of the off-Earth alien cultures we've invented tend to be very monochrome in what they do. Like, you know what a Klingon is mm -hmm. almost immediately. It's all of Klingon, basically. It's all of the Vulcans. It's all of the people from any given planet. When we have all of these diverse societies and cultures and ways of thinking here on this one planet, it just seems a little bit unlikely that that's going to be the case, which is why it's odd to me that it's this idea that seems to have persisted in science fiction specifically. And it makes me especially hopeful for opportunities for all kinds of people to get involved in both science fiction and literal space exploration so that we can make sure that we're ready for this diversity of thought when we do encounter the unknown and the unexpected. I think that really becomes the exciting part as well, to really look at how you can really integrate these concepts and, and build and move forward. Because a, a, lot of our, a lot of the science fiction that we've created and, and sometimes in the canon is based on assumptions that we're working with. And, and even being able to challenge ourselves with this whole idea of projecting something into the future is a, a transformative experience. To, I mean, I would say some of the stories that I've written, and I wonder if this is the same for you, it really helped challenge your own sense of limitation around oh, yeah. identity, around how you function in a society. The best ones, yeah. Mm -hmm. They transport you to a different place from where you are. And again, it gives you a perspective you would never have otherwise. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, definitely. One other thing that I would say is that democratizing space, I think, will have a huge benefit to us for this. And, and everybody in this room is familiar with the overview effect, that idea of getting up into space and suddenly all of those borders go away. You see how isolated and alone Earth is and how we're all in this together. I think that is going to be one of the single most helpful things we do. And again, getting a large number of diverse people up in space to experience that, look around the universe and realize we've got to do this together. I think that is going to be one of the most important events. So how do we do it? <laughs> right, I would hope we don't have to wait for that to feel that way. <laughs> uh, so in terms of, again, space exploration, since we're all here thinking about Apollo and the amazing things that were done 50 years ago, what are some of the things that you've seen in scientific developments in the recent past that has either informed what you're doing now or that you think could be informative for some really cutting edge science fiction? Huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not really in your world. It's been, <laughs> right. goes to, well, go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, I don't know, given, I mean, again, given, given what I do, I don't know. In, in terms, of it's once again, I'm going to go the, in, in the opposite direction with the yeah. with, with the Klingon stuff because um, when when I started doing all this stuff, people said and would meet people say, "What do you do?" And I made a, made up Klingon. Oh, how strange that is! 
to make up a language, and it's not. I mean, linguists and, and people interested in language have been doing that for thousands and thousands of years. Um, but I've said in some other contexts, what I did is unusual because I ended up in 70 millimeter. But, but the idea of making up a language is, is not a new thing. Um, so where was I going to go with this? So, uh, but, but, but the difference was when, when most people make up languages, they're doing it uh, for, for their own purposes. Mm. They, they, they want to explore something about themselves about, uh, uh, very personally or mm. look at new ways to deal with society or, or something like that. Um, but they're in charge. Okay. Yeah. What I did, I was not in charge. I, you know, I was, I was given a script. I was given, in the case of, the, of the, the Vulcans and the Klingons, they exist already. So I had to come up with something that fit in um, with what's already there. So in the case of Klingon in particular, the vocabulary that I developed was what was needed for the films and the TV shows. So it's all this, for lack of a better word, you know, outer space vocabulary. And someone pointed out, you know, so in, in Klingon, you can talk about a bridge, like a bridge on a ship, but you can't talk about a bridge like a bridge over a river, okay? Because it didn't come up in the scripts. That's all. And there was a, a project we had a while back where someone wanted to uh, create a, a CD or a DVD language learning thing for Klingon uh, that was based on a template used for Earth languages. So and all the vocabulary, and, and, and specifically European languages, was all the vocabulary was based on those sorts of things. And I said, well, this is silly because if I'm going to get a disc to teach me French, so I can go to France, I need, you know, uh, so all the terminology related to France is going to be in there. But if I'm going to get a, a DVD to teach me Klingon, and I'm going to go to the Klingon planet, I don't want the words that are associated with France. That doesn't make any sense. But they decided to do it anyway. And the Klingon speakers thought this was just wonderful. Because they said, now we can talk about everyday things. So now there is a word for bridge. Just they're based river. on Earth. After, right, right. Yeah. So, so, that, so that taking it out of science fiction, bring it into the real world, I, this has nothing to do with your question. Okay. That take it out of, out of, take it out of science fiction <laughs> and He's an the artist. World. He's, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> has expanded it as opposed to the other way around. You know, as opposed to taking it out of the real world and going into fiction. It was taking it out of fiction and bringing it into the real world is what's made it bigger. And I think that's what's really exciting is thinking about these social structures. One of the ideas I play with in the Rayleigh Universe series is looking at if you're creating this new society, what laws are you working with? Uh, if it's uh, the, the planet, I call it Planet Hope, uh, which was created in the Rayleigh series, the uh, this backdrop is, is that you had people who initially came there who were space tourists looking to create a utopia. You had your scientists who came. And then at some point you had this lottery. And then past that you had Earth trying to get rid of people they just didn't want on Earth anymore. And the, some of the class dynamics were, were built around that notion. But my question would be, you know, what sort of laws would people start working with? If you have people from all over the world, what would become important? What would we preserve culturally? And then what would become new? Uh, what would be valuable from the Earth experience that would continue to be relevant on these new planets? And at least in this storyline, this planet, Planet Hope, it was a colony, but it goes independent because at some point they want control over their own resources. They have their own futures that they want to build. And it's interesting to think about looking at the Earth as being a past experience. And, and I'm just really curious, almost from an anthropological, anthropological or standpoint, what would we preserve? What storylines, what mythologies would become significant based on who went? Well, you're right about that. I mean, if we encounter an alien species at that point, Earth's past would be completely past. We would change completely as we dealt with, absorbed, or became, uh, you know, well, we would change. Mm -hmm. But initially, I thought you were talking about the, the world building process and consistency of laws, but my God, thinking, you know, space law, that's gonna be a burgeoning <laughs> thing. But doing it with an alien species, that's gonna be a whole other level of lawsuits, but, <laughs> you know, which dimension are you suing me? I don't know. <laughs> uh, oh, by the way, by the answer to the question about uh, what technology post Apollo, I'm interested in most. And I'm gonna to try to take the temperature of this uh, on the rest of the day and, and the rest of the crowd is uh, rotational gravity or spin gravity. And I'm always amazed that this seems to be something that has perennial, perennially pushed down the priority list. But if we're going to spend some time in space, mm. we really need it. And it mathematically works and it just seems like that's something we should absolutely be doing. 
if, you know, putting up a test bed where we can, even if, even if you did want to go and colonize Mars, which I personally don't think is a great idea, but if you were to do it, you'd have to, you'd want to test varying levels of gravity to find out what the minimum dose of gravity is for people to be healthy before you got there. And so in that sense, putting up a space station where you can spin it at various rates for certain time periods would be invaluable, I would think. And yet here we are, we're 50 years after Apollo, and we haven't done that yet. So. Yeah, it does seem like we'd have more space stations that people right? could visit. We were promised a lot more space stations. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I've had my opportunities, so now I'd like to open it up to the room for any questions for our panelists. Let me see. Uh, yes, over here. The thing, thank you for not throwing it. <laughs> so I'm curious uh, if any of you see a role in science fiction for basically um, making progress in diversity and inclusion. And we want you to give your answer in Klingon. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> I have a translator. <laughs> well, I do a lot of work uh, engaging STEAM uh, around diversity and inclusion. And, and and I don't always label it diversity and, and inclusion per se. I'm just working in communities that I'm a part of and talking to people about futures and encouraging them to write stories about those futures or showing them stories that have been written around those futures. I think the most exciting thing that gets people really wanting to jump into science is this idea that they can play a role in the future. So there was an organization that I had an opportunity to, to speak with, and they were just kids in their community, and they were coming up, they were studying Afrofuturism, and quick sidebar, Afrofuturism is a way of looking at the future or alternate realities, but you're pulling from black cultures. Uh, it intersects the imagination, liberation, technology, black culture, and then mysticism. So that takes it a bit away from hard science sometimes because it integrates those things. And it does look at the future, the past, the present as flip sides of, of one. Uh, and it values the divine feminine, looking at intuition as being equally balanced to, say, logic. So all of that, just having that discussion and having people really explore ideas and, and looking at their relationship with space, claiming the, the fact that people of African descent and all people around the world have had a relationship with the future, have helped to transform those futures. Those discussions inspire people and help them feel empowered and then leads particular teens to want to to feel like they can make a difference in their neighborhoods and they can come up, they can utilize technologies to, to barely be able to do so. So it was kind of fun. This one group, there were these teenagers and they came up with ideas where they had a, a drone that could deliver prescription medications. And this was, you know, they came up with it. They didn't actually invent it, but they were, you know, or they had a, a mask, uh, and they said, oh, if you put on this mask and they create a little film with it, then it would protect you from uh, police violence. And, you know, it was all sorts of resolutions that they were coming up with. They had holograms that you could see through glasses that would help you to find community services in the area. And so these are all experiments of mind, right? But they're based on technologies that we have today. And just the fact that they, in the imaginative sense, could, could construct of these ideas lent itself to them wanting to, to build and say, oh, you know, I can go into science or seeing how science relates to just social structures and how it can be a part of your daily life. So for that, it was empowering. I do a lot with dance, using dance and the body as a way to sort of bridge space and time, uh, using teaching dances like West African and Samba, but also giving students an opportunity to do sort of freestyle dance where they're, say, embodying the idea of a supernova or thinking of a star and, you know, what movements would be integrated with that. And what I found to be really interesting was automatically they saw how they were a bridge through time, how they connected the people of the past with people moving into the future. And it lent, to, lent it to... it. It lent itself to people wanting to say, oh, wow, you know, what if I, you know, could go to space or uh, what if I interacted with people who are on other planets? And I mean, so fundamentally, they start to see themselves as a person in the universe and a, a person who is a part of a larger spectrum of time and not just in the here and now. And I think that long view vision uh, just helps facilitate agency and creativity. Uh, 
I could go on and on <laughs> about that perspective, but thank you for the question. Should I answer as well? I, I yeah, would yeah. say that diversity is going to be enormously important because of the mission critical nature of teams working together in space. Um, I'm racking my brain for the title of Joey's book, but uh, Whiplash, thank you. Uh, one of the great chapters to me in Whiplash was his discussion of why you need diversity. Even if you're just a, uh, let's say, a, a selfishly enlightened person, it's in your own interest to get a diverse team so that you avoid blindness of certain areas, so that you can see things that you would not otherwise see. And it seems to me in space that would be especially important, that you get all opinions, all perspectives, because it's life or death out there, and it can make all the difference, would be the, the reason for diversity, if no other, and there's plenty of others. Yeah, and not, not, not to be trite, uh, but in theory, that's what Star Trek is all about, is in, uh, inclusion uh, and diversity. In fact, the, that's the way I got involved in Star Trek in the first place, is because there was a short little scene uh, with Mr. Spock and a, and a female Vulcan uh, named Savik. And the, the, the scene was filmed with the actor speaking English, but in, in editing and in post-production, they decided, no, it would make more sense if they were speaking Vulcan to each other. So we, I made up, despite what I said earlier, I made up gobbledygook that matched the lips <laughs> and they put in subtitles. Um, and that, that was how I got involved. But anyway, the reason they wanted to make the, the change is important. The reason they wanted to make the change is to show that these particular characters had something in common with each other, okay, above and beyond pointy ears, okay, and that was shown by, shown by the language, and also to show that they were different from the other people who were on the ship, but part of it as well, and they wanted to do that very subtly, and they did it by means of having them speak their own language as opposed to a lot of verbiage that was actually in there but cut out. Uh, any other questions from the room? And wave vociferously, because I'm kind of blinded by the lights here. Yeah. There's someone over here. Oh, over there. hello. <laughs> oh. I'm not throwing it all the way over there. <laughs> Pass it down. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. That's a huge thing. There. That's right, a beach ball. <laughs> gonna... Hi, thanks. Um, my question is about science fiction that was written about a future, but now has pat come and pass. For instance, uh, like Jules Verne shooting a, <laughs> a cannon at the moon to land on it, or uh, in 2015 we had Back to the Future Day, which was written in 1985. Uh, how do you explain the difference between what we think about is going to be the future versus what actually becomes a reality, and how do you incorporate that into your, your writing? Well, I think sometimes it really just points to, it, it makes a big statement about where we are at the time. Uh, I think for me, I tried to work around those issues by pushing it 200 years into the future, and I don't have to be held to it you know, for too long. <laughs> I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> but the other fun part I think about not projecting it that far is that you can also work with issues and, and try to make predictions around that. Now, of course, if you aren't correct, that's okay, because it makes a really fascinating statement with what was important at the time, so it almost becomes like this artifact of sorts yeah. around a perspective of the future or what we call retro futures. I actually don't even think of it as, as prediction. I, I think of it as prototyping. You know, like I said earlier, what I'm trying to do is explore possible futures, and they might be futures that we don't want to inhabit. And, and you can think of it as, as dodging icebergs or whatever. Well, somebody has to go and spot those icebergs. Um, I've had the experience where uh, I've written stories that I thought had utopian elements, and people would get back in touch with me saying, well, this is very much a dystopia. And I think, well, that's a, that's a difference of opinion. Uh, but again, if I, if I get a future wrong, it actually isn't going to upset me too much, because you know, if we avert a potential future that I don't think is worth living in, then I'd be very happy to be wrong, that we don't actually go there. I do think it's a challenge, though, to come up with utopian worlds. Yeah, in some, easier in some to create ways. a dystopia. Right, it creates a bigger arc for the character if it's a <laughs> dystopia, they get to be a hero. Uh, but I do think that's a fun thing to think about, wow, what if everything is kind of okay and we're dealing with human issues? You know, it's interesting you bring that up because you hear this all the time, utopia, dystopia. I think we are always living right in the middle because there's wonderful things that are happening and there's terrible things that are happening. And I think the future is going to be like that. It's going to be a little bit of both, if we're lucky. 
All right, well, unfortunately, we are out of time. So thank you so much to all of our panelists for being here today. Thank you, all of you.